This is Richard Wolf from Democracy at Work responding to another Ask Prof. Wolf question from our Patreon community. This question comes from Knox Morris. And Knox Morris asks a very important question. Knox refers to an economics teacher who has explained in a class why, in this teacher's view, putting price controls on landlords, and that typically means putting an upper limit on how much rent a landlord can charge, is a bad idea, a poor economic policy, because what it will do is lead to fewer apartments being created, built, and therefore in the long run defeating its purpose. The mistake here is so simple that the really interesting question, and I'll go into what the mistake is in a moment, the really interesting question is how you could keep repeating something as silly as this. And the answer is, when the wind is blowing in a certain ideological direction, all kinds of silly things can be said which win nods of agreement by people who aren't really listening all that closely to the specific argument, otherwise they would refute it, but they like where it goes, where it points, what it's part of in terms of an ideological affirmation. And so they go along. And so the criticism that would in other circumstances have assaulted such a nonsense uh, isn't heard, isn't taken in, and so the idea gets repeated. So here, let's go. The idea behind this is simple enough. If you allow rentals to go up, if the government does not step in with price controls and allows rents that landlords charge to go up and up, they will make more money. And if they make more money, there will be investors excited about the prospect of more money building more rental units to get a hold of the high-priced rents. So far, so good. But is that necessary? And the answer is, of course, not at all. In other words, you could limit rentals, say they can't go above a certain amount, and you wouldn't have any problem at all. Let's see how this would work. You limit the rentals. Landlords, unable to charge more, slow down, stop investing in more rental units. Okay, if that were to happen over time, quite a while, and more and more people, population grew, and there weren't more rental units, well, you could see that after a certain point, there'd be a kind of competition among people. And even if the rents were limited by law, you'd probably see lots of illegal arrangements being made as desperate people who can't legally pay more offer to pay more illegally in order to get these scarce apartments. All of that is possible. But there's an easy fix, which many, many societies, including the United States, have found for precisely this situation. If the private sector doesn't invest in housing enough to provide decent housing at manageable rents for the population, there's always an option. In fact, there's two that I can think of right off the bat, because these two have been used in a variety of places for at least several centuries. Number one, the government builds, owns, and operates housing. That's right, public housing. If the private sector cannot produce housing without gouging the population more than is reasonable, well then, the government will come in and do it. And you know, here's some examples. At various times in American history, that's exactly what's been done. 
There wasn't enough housing, particularly after World Wars I and II, and so the government came in and helped with the housing. That's how you do it. That's one way to do it. Then you have public housing. Number two, you can have the government subsidize communal or collective housing. That's when the government builds a housing project and then, in effect, sells it to communities of people who collectively own and operate the housing that they buy over time with their rentals from the government. Since the government doesn't have to make a profit on what it does, it can charge an amount of money that the folks getting together for this kind of collective housing management can afford. This way they get to pay rents lower than what the private sector could have and would have taken from them, have decent housing, become their own managers of that housing, etc. There are still other ways, but it's clear that there is no need whatsoever to fall for what landlords and their spokespersons are telling you and telling us. There is no one-way necessity that they be free to charge as much as they want. In fact, I think most people would be in favor of the following. An economic system is justified, is effective, is successful if it provides certain basic things to all the people. Food, clothing, and shelter are the famous three. A system unable to do that because it overcharges for one or all of those three is a failure. If you're charging, as is the case in the United States today, more than 20 to 30 percent of most people's income for their housing, you are not doing an effective economic job. That is, since we have a private housing sector in this country, a private housing industry, it's showing that the private way of going about it isn't working real well. So either the landlords have to take it on the chin, earn less so that the mass of people have housing, or else the government has to step in, which will end up with pretty much the same result, but it will solve what is the major problem here, which is providing affordable, decent housing for the people of the country. This is Richard Wolf responding to the Ask Prof. Wolf activities of our Patreon community.